Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam tonight. I uh, hope you uh, got through our nice uh, warm weather we've been having. Uh, anytime North Carolina gets down to 9 degrees, everything stops. Uh, the kids have been out of school. Uh, people say, well, why is the streets are, are, are good and clear? Well, try riding through some of our subdivisions and uh, where we don't have snow piles going through and the trees are covered. There's still a lot of ice out there. Uh, my daughter says that my grandkids about to go crazy. I think it's the other way around. I think she's about to go crazy. But uh, tonight's show, we were going to have a special guest. Uh, situations uh, came up that he could not be here tonight, so we will have uh, Carrie Turner with us uh, next show, which I believe is the 25th of January. Looking forward to that one. The Newsweek magazine will be out with the information about uh, Joseph Hargrove and the other two Marines that were deserted on the uh, island of Koh Tang uh, after the, uh, May is it Mayaquez? Is that the way I'm, is it Mayaquez or Mayaquez? Mayaquez. Mayaquez, okay. I, my, I just can't get that right. As soon as I remember it, I'm going, then I start thinking which way it is. But uh, the ship that was captured by the Cambodians right after the fall of Saigon, uh, they are actually listed on the wall as the last battle of Vietnam, even though it was in uh, Cambodia, and it was well after, which is another interesting thing, because it was well after the uh, fall of Saigon, but they're still considered part of the Vietnam War. Um, as you tune in tonight uh, to the show, be sure to tell your friends about us. Uh, one good way to come in to come in and be part of the show, answer questions, uh, get me uh, straighten me out on anything I say that's uh, not true, because uh, sometimes when you're doing research, you see research one way and you see research the other way. It's kind of uh, pick the one you like the best and, and go from there. As, a lot, as you know, that, uh, if you're a Vietnam vet, uh, there's a lot of myths out there about uh, who we are and what we did and so forth. But you can dial 919-518-9773 and be part of the show. But even better is to log in on Skype, and that's Computers 2K Voice, just like it is there on your screen. Uh, don't even read that to you, but I did, uh, so you can uh, get it and come in. If you do need, have some ideas and so forth for uh, me or uh, Enron Nissan, the producer, we're in the world headquarters of Nissan Communications here tonight in beautiful downtown Raleigh, right at the edge of uh, Cary. Uh, so if you have some suggestions, questions, or comments or whatever, you're always welcome. That's uh, Lessons of Vietnam at ncbi.org. Okay, uh, next slide. They did not see that. They didn't see that one? Oh, okay. Well, I was reading about a slide that you didn't even see. I'm sorry. Well, that's the information which I just told you, so we can that's skip right. right on over that one. I just told you about it anyway. Uh, the next one here is uh, something I wanted to remind you of. This is your show, and uh, the, it's about the Vietnam War and those who were involved at home and or those in country. Uh, that is anything from war protesters to uh, having a relative who was in, involved in the Vietnam War, either home or whatever. But it's your show, so uh, participate, take part, uh, put in your two cents worth. We'll give you a penny change if you put your two cents worth in. But uh, tonight's show is kind of a uh, strange title. It's called the American Raid on Song Tay POW Camp. It was a successful failure. The intelligence for this was, this raid uh, was uh, less than uh, perfect, to be put that way. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. But uh, Song Tay was a POW camp uh, located in Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam, that is. If you look at the map there, you'll see the arrow that from the Gulf of Tonkin, which shows you where Hanoi is located. And then just to the left of that is the Song Te, uh POW camp. And it's in, and like I said, it's in Vietnam, North Vietnam, uh, kind of close to Hanoi, so you know there's a lot of uh, communists and so forth around it. After about 1966, after we got the war going and so forth, uh, it became clear uh, to the president and his administration that the uh, North Vietnamese communists were not uh, forthcoming with information about who was POWs and who was not POWs. Uh, we didn't know some of the people, the pilots were shot down or disappeared, whether they were alive, dead, because we got nothing whatsoever out of the uh, North Vietnamese. They were considered uh, not as uh, prisoner of war. They were uh, war crimes or, or criminals and so forth. 
<clears throat> excuse me, they set up an interagency prisoner of war intelligence committee, and they put together, they were uh, parts of the CIA, the FBI, the Department of State, and all the other spooky uh, groups that we have in the United States government and, and security and so forth. They put all these organizations together working in the uh, in interagency prisoner of war intelligence committee. Uh, it's the group was about as long as the information there, and the entire program about the POW and, and so forth was called uh, Operation Bright Light. The POW compound uh, Songte was first discovered in September of 1967. They discovered it there, uh, and reconnaissance uh, discovered it, and they decided to uh, keep an eye on it, so they kept an eye on it for several years. Now, that uh, DIA, the Department of Intelligence Agency, was uh, having its own internal problems at that time. They were, um, uh, some of the people who were put in charge had never been in charge of intelligence. Uh, the, the committees were not always working together. Uh, it's hard to believe. I know that with some of the government facilities were not, or organizations were not working or playing uh, good with each other. Uh, so they were having uh, a lot of problems. A lot of, they were almost overwhelmed and so forth. But in getting getting the information, they didn't know what to do with it after they got it. But in June of 1970, they uh, kind of uh, saw that Songte was an active POW camp, and, <clears throat> and the uh, the brains of the security uh, and intelligence people got together and said they thought there was at least 61 Americans being held there. Uh, in reality, it was never more than 55, but uh, they uh, it, Songte had become under their radar. Later in June uh, that year, that same month, that same year, 1970, the Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed a rescue mission to President Nixon. They felt that Songte was uh, its location and so forth would be a good opportunity to go into North Vietnam, make a statement, and uh, rescue some POWs. Uh, Nixon uh, immediately agreed to it, and he put together a, uh, a group to uh, study and find out what to do. So they spent uh, five months with uh, inter-service and inter-agency intelligence gathering and so forth. And uh, again, we're going back to different uh, intelligence and gathering groups and different agencies uh, who didn't always play well together. And um, But this information was all brought together, and they put together a um, information about Songte itself. It seems that there was a lot of problems going into Songte that they didn't really think about to start with. Uh, there was military uh, establishments close by. There was Air Force establishments close by. But uh, all this information gave the planners uh, an opportunity to uh, figure out how to distract the troops that they, in the area uh, when they went into a song Tay. Now, the original raid was set up for October, but uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger uh, came along and delayed the raid because he wanted the, uh, Nixon to be able to look at the uh, plan. Watch, I'm not certain what Nixon would know about the plan if he saw it, but uh, he wanted him to approve the final plan. So then uh, they gave it to him, and he finally approved it. And then three days before they were scheduled to uh, do the raid, uh, a little flying ointment came up. Uh, they kind of got the intelligence that Song Tay was probably empty. Newer gathered uh, intelligence uh, showed that camp activity had been really cut down. Air photography uh, didn't show any changes uh, there because it had a lot of trees and so forth, but human intelligence uh, came out with information that the uh, POW had been moved to a uh, different camp. But our government already, our agency had already had a plan, so... They came back and they poured over all the intelligence and so forth and all the uh, all the big wigs coming up and going, analysis going, let's see now, what are, we, are, are they there or are they not there? And they were going to send some uh, drones and some, uh, I didn't realize they had drones back during the Vietnam War, but they did. They were going to send in some drones, I guess like U-2 pilots, U-2s, uh, flying back. They were going to send those over to take some new pictures. Uh, but the problem was that the weather uh, uh, as you probably know about, as we, if you've seen the show before, uh, Vietnam weather is either rainy or dry, and not much in between. A lot of rain when it does. So uh, the weather was not uh, that good, so 
they had equal information. They had, on one hand, they had information that the people were there. On the other hand, they had information that the guys weren't there. Uh, but they had spent all this time and effort on a raid, so they decided, let's go ahead and do it anyway. We don't have, we can't prove it one way or the other. The best way to do it is send some men in. So uh, it's it's nearly impossible to get this many people working together. As it says here, the Songte raid brought together more than 100 combat transport aircraft from three different services and intelligence agencies. That alone is a is a feat unknown to man as far as getting all the agencies that got together. You're talking about Air Force, Navy, uh, CIA, uh, all the intelligence, the Army, uh, a little bit of everybody coming together and actually working together. Now, let's talk about the boots on the ground training. Why this plan was coming along, they had to train uh, a group. Uh, Secretary of uh, Army General uh, Errol Wheeler, Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff, uh, he approved the plan. Uh, on June 10th, 1970, a 15-man group led by uh, Army Brigadier General Donald D. Blackburn, uh, he was Assistant General Wheeler, got together and they started doing this plan that we had just talked about a little bit. The initial phase of the rescue attempt was dubbed Polo Circle. As you can see, they definitely wanted to have uh, complete secrecy because every group that did something had a different code name. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, you had one group says they're there, and another group says they're not there. So nobody could disprove either way. Uh, so I have imagined that was uh, been interesting to be a fly on the wall and watch the discussions back and forth between the two, going, yeah, they are, and no, they're not. Yeah, yeah, they are, no, they're not. But, um, so then they came up with the uh, CIA put together a mock-up of Songte. Nobody ever told this team who was going in. Bull Simmons, uh, who led the ground uh, troop, Colonel Bull Simmons, uh, which we'll visit with a little bit later, uh, he went to Fort Bragg and he uh, took 100 uh, Special Forces guys and picked the 50, 53 or so that he wanted on his team. And they uh, trained and trained, but nobody told them they were going into Songte or a prisoner of war. Um, so they built this mock-up someplace. I forgot where now where it was. I think it was in South Carolina. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, and some people thought uh, every night they took it down. That's how secret they were and then put it back up every day. But they went in and doing, during the daytime, they'd go in and do dry runs. Uh, they practiced all the different uh, positioning they were supposed to do, who was supposed to do what, and, and so forth when the uh, helicopters hit the ground. There was actually three helicopters uh, supposed to be going into the complex itself. The CIA constructed uh, the camp called uh, Barbara, which was there, uh, uh, another code name, uh, made out of two befores and, 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 and cloth. And, uh, but, one, but once the training got more intense, uh, the guys doing the training uh, really were shocked because they started using live ammunition. It's hard to go oops when you're using live ammunition. Uh, you don't make a whole lot of mistakes uh, uh, if you do, you got to replace somebody uh, doing the uh, live ammunition. So that was totally different than what they were used to. Uh, so what they were doing, why they were there, they really didn't know. Uh, they had some only ideas. That, but they wanted to make the training as realistic as possible. They used uh, several ba uh, buildings there on the bases. They got uh, people to volunteer to be prisoners. Because when you go into a uh, POW camp like that, uh, you can't tell the prisoners in advance that you're coming. Uh, it's kind of hard to call them on the phone and say, hey, we're coming to get you, and so forth. So they had different scenarios. The problem was that they were afraid that we got there. First of all, they had to uh, make sure the prisoners realized that they were good guys coming to get them. There's always the chance that some of the prisoners were mad with some of the other prisoners, said they were collaborating and so forth. So they had to go through all those scenarios so they would know how to, uh, how to control the prisoners and so forth. Uh, not that they were trying to uh, uh, force them, uh, prisoners, but they wanted to know how to uh, communicate with them and, and do whatever they could for the safety of the prisoners. So they started working on the uh, with rescue with prisoners, and they would have the scenarios, uh, just the, the 
volunteer prisoners would create these scenarios so they could get used to them and so forth. And uh, they always try to find who was in charge and so forth, which was usually the commanding officer. And again, I'm going to tell you that uh, it's important to uh, as you realize this as we're going through training. Here they are going out there training with live ammunition at nights and so forth, and they're going in, they don't even know where they're going yet. They don't know they're going out to POWs. They don't know they're going to any place called Song Te or in North Vietnam. All they know is they're going to go rescue some people. In fact, they thought they were going to rescue hostages on a hijacked airplane. So they were kept all in the, in the dark. I mean, security was really tight. After three months of training day and night, uh, they loaded the team up uh, and transport a plane, and they flew them to uh, uh, Thailand. Uh, Taki, hi, well, yeah, you can read it because you can read it better than I can pronounce it. Uh, Air Force Base in Thailand. Uh, but when they left, when they left on the airplane, their uniforms had nothing whatsoever to uh, tie them back to the United States. The weapons, the uniforms had no insignias. They were, as the uh, CIA calls it, sterile. They had nothing to relate them back to uh, Americans which even though they don't have that, you got a couple of guys on there that probably, like me, have a Southern accent. It's kind of hard to say that they're not uh, American, but uh, y'all know that Southerners don't have accents anyway. But uh, when they got there, they were put into a compound surrounded by high fences and barbed wire and guard dogs. It's like they were prisoners themselves, but they didn't want anybody to come in and talk to them, see them, or whatever. After about three or four days in the compound, uh, they were ushered into a large auditorium, and one of the uh, co plans with one of the uh, co commanders, along with Bull Simmons, was Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bud Sidnor. He came in, he was in charge of uh, security. He came in, he was the one who showed him a map with a big red circle in it and says, Okay, guys, this is where we're going. And everybody got excited. They were going in to really do something for the war, they were going in to rescue. American POWs, that had to make them feel really, really good uh, that they were going to do something. This is a picture of Song Te uh, area. If you notice up in the right is the POW uh, compound. Down left-hand corner, uh, the secondary school is located there. That is an important uh, part of the story, so remember the secondary school. Uh, then there's a um, uh, Song Te city. And right out from that, it's, a, it's an air base and some other stuff. But that kind of give you an idea of uh, what Song Te was uh, in the river and the road going by. After they left that uh, place in, uh, in Thailand, they flew to Udorn, which I think everything left at Udorn, of all the bombers and so forth. And they boarded on their choppers, uh, helicopters for the mission. Now, there were three helicopters actually uh, supposed to go in and land on the... Um, on, on the compound or in the compound area in Song Te. Uh, each one of them had a definite assignment. Now, there was other things that were supposed to be going on. There were flare ships that were supposed to be going in and keeping the uh, North Vietnamese Air Force busy. Uh, they had uh, different other, other helicopters and airplanes and, and soldiers who were to uh, create diversions for the Song Te raid to go in. But the helicopters were codenamed Blue Boy, Red wine and green leaf. Now I'm going to give you a test on in a few minutes to see that which ones you go, which ones which. Blue boy, red wine, and green leaf. Now the, part of the reason they gave these names because the helicopters going in uh, were Apple One, Apple Two, Apple Three, Apple Four, Apple Five, and uh, so they would keep up from which helicopter was Apple. Uh, the group itself I had to have their own uh, uh, code names and so forth. And one of the uh, Lockheed C-130Es had uh, malfunctioned and, and had to leave anyway. Now, if you look at this next slide, this will kind of give you an idea. If you look at the um, left side there, uh, you see where um, red wine was supposed to land. They're supposed to land outside the uh, compound there on the left and uh, set up a perimeter there. Blue Boy was actually supposed to fly in and land inside the compound, and Greenleaf was supposed to take that area uh, right out from it. Uh, this was the, was the plan. Uh, the only one that was supposed to be actually going into the uh, compound to get the POWs was Blue Boy. 
Now let's talk about the rain itself. It's interesting, we were just talking about it. The Songte Raiders patch says November 21st. Kind of gets you the idea that maybe they had the patches made before they went on the trip. Because, as I mentioned before, the weather in Vietnam was somewhat uh, unpredictable. Uh, on November 20th, they're at the uh, air base there in Udon, and the um, weather personnel comes in and says there's a, a problem. There was going to be um, a typhoon coming in. Uh, the training uh, code name for their training was Operation Kingpin. This is the overall code name for this. So the, his ready to, uh, they're getting ready to go in, but there were some problems there. Let's talk about Song Tae again. Uh, the Song Tae, Song Tae was a prisoner of war camp located about 23 miles west of Hanoi. It was a small camp uh, right outside uh, Song Tae Sound. Uh, had a courtyard that was 140 by 125 feet uh, with a fence around, uh, surrounded by rice paddies and a 40-foot trees. Uh, like I said, there was one of the reasons they had so much problems with the uh, reconnaissance that there were so many trees and stuff around. Along with that uh, compound was, uh, was a seven-foot wall uh, encircled the prison, had three observation towers that you'd like you see in the movies, uh, so they could keep an eye on the POWs and uh, probably never thought about someone actually coming in to rescue them and so forth. And they were housed in four large buildings, which if you kind of remember the slide a while ago, it showed you the four buildings and so forth. Now, Sunte and Aplo, which was another POW camp located 30 miles from Hanoi, uh, they were first in, uh, identified by the Intelligence uh, Prisoner of War Intelligence Committee, as we mentioned before. Uh, when they were doing the original reconnaissance, they saw S-A-R written in the ground with rocks. And someone decided that spelled out what to be, to be the prisoner's laundry, uh, an arrow with a number of eight, indicating, well, supposed to be indicating that this is the POWs had to travel to fields where they worked. I'm not certain who came up with that, but uh, there was... Uh, uh, I have seen pictures of SAR uh, written in the ground there. Uh, there, uh, The reconnaissance around, around Song Tay reveals some troubling aspects, as I mentioned before. First of all, the um, headquarters of the 12th North Vietnamese Army uh, told 12,000 troops were close by. Uh, if you remember a while ago when I said there were 53 soldiers on the raid, uh, they're kind of outnumbered when you got 12,000 troops close by. Second, the artillery training school, a supply depot, and an air defense in installation were in close proximity to the prison. Third, about 500 yards from the Song Tay compound was a compound known as the secondary school. Now remember that, secondary school, because it's going to take a play in a minute. And it was administration center for the guards. Fourth, the Fukiang Air Base was only 20 miles northeast of the compound. You start wondering why someone figured this was such a good place to go in and rescue uh, POWs. I mean, one side you got 12,000 troops, the other side you got uh, an air base and uh, well fortified around it, but who am I to uh, question the uh, intelligence committees? Um, they knew when they went in it had to be done fast. I mean, real fast, because uh, there was no way they could go, oops, let's do this, let's try this again because there wasn't enough time. As I mentioned before, and by the summer of 1970, photos showed Song Tay to be less active than usual, and by autumn, the camp had almost no signs of life, uh, which again came back to weather problems and the trees and so forth. But Dong Hoi, another PO camp, which is 15 miles to the east of Song Tay, had increased activity. So the question was, were they still at Sante or they had been moved to uh, a Dong Ha? And then you start asking, why had the prisons been relocated? Had the North Vietnamese learned about the rescue attempt? I mean, all this code stuff, but so forth. If you still got all the people uh, were training in, uh, in all the training they did, so forth. Uh, had the North Vietnamese spies found out about this rescue attempt? Uh, just why would they move? Uh, they had been moved for a simple reason. And Sante was located in the Song Kong River, which had overflowed its banks because of the flooding. The POWs had been transported to Dong Hoi. Now, uh, on our previous show, 
uh, one of the prisoners that was there, uh, Bill Schutte, explained to us that uh, the wells uh, went, were bad. Uh, and I think one of the reasons the wells went bad is because when the river overflowed, it, uh, that uh, nasty water out of the rivers got into the wells and the clear water. So uh, they moved them for fresh water. Now, Operation Kingpin, which was the overall t uh, code name for Songtay Raid, um, was approved finally on November 18th. The following day, let me read that again. The following day, Admiral Thomas Moore, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs, received information that the POWs had definitely been moved to Donghoi. Okay? This was after it was approved on the 18th. The 19th, they found out that the prisoners had been moved. Okay. Um, Paul is saying in the chat about the dates. Uh-huh. He says, Vietnam is 12 hours ahead of us. Maybe it was November 20th in the USA and November 21st in Vietnam. That's a possibility. <laughs> uh, or the other way around. <laughs> uh, that could be. I mean, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but unless they did have the patches made in advance. But uh, either way, I want to talk to someone of the uh, Songte Raiders. Now... Unfortunately, the planners, next slide, uh, nixed the idea of moving to Donghoi. In other words, here we have, uh, we've trained Gordon in Songte. We know now that the prisoners are not at Songte, they're at Donghoi. But we train for Songte. And if we change the plan at the last minute, we may have problems shifting the attack. Nobody seemed to ever thought about the idea. Let's take a month off. Let's go, we already know what they're doing. Let's just go train going into Don Hoy. There can't be that much difference. And look at, get, get some photos of the uh, compound. But I'm just, you know, an uneducated guy. I'm not one of these high intelligence guys. So I would never have thought of, you know, come up with that. But they decided that changing it from Songte to Don Hoy would just be a disaster. So they planned a date. Of November 20th. But then we had another problem. A typhoon in the area. A typhoon in the Philippines that was heading that way. So they had a, a tight window to get in. And if you remember, they had to uh, have um, decoys. They had to have aircraft going on and Navy ships coming in to create decoys for the Air Force and the 12,000 uh, North Vietnamese Congress were close by. So it was kind of hard to get all that done. So they came up with another great idea. After the uh, weatherman, uh, military weatherman came up and says, okay, the 21st is going to be a bad day. But let's, we can go on the 20th because that's going to be a tight window, but we can do it. So they decided to change the date. So 20th of November was the day they went in. And as it was just mentioned, uh, was that 20th of November in the United States, Thailand, or Vietnam? Just what date was that uh, date, the 20th, we came up with? As, uh, that's an interesting question. I'm going to have to do some research on that. But uh, it started the 21st. They went in on uh, 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 20th. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, the three helicopters. The Greenleaf team, which was supposed to go in first, uh, with Bull Simmons, who was the leader on board, the pilot kind of got mixed up. They landed over by the secondary school. If you remember where the secondary school was, it was kind of down left of uh, in your picture from uh, the Songte uh, compound. They landed there and suddenly decided they probably were in the wrong place because they got in a firefight right there on the spot. Uh, they killed about a hundred and some um, NVA troops and realized they were the wrong spot. So they flew back out to and back over to the compound which created another problem. See, Greenleaf was supposed to be the he first helicopter in. The second helicopter going in was Blue Boy. No, excuse me, let me back up. So that was not supposed to go in. I'll come back to that one in a minute. Blue Boy was uh, tasked with landing inside the compound. The problem with landing inside the compound was the hole was kind of small in between the seven-foot fence, the trees, and everything else. So 
they have pretty much decided before the helicopter went in, it was going to probably crash. Uh, and it did. Uh, they hit hard. The uh, blades hit some of the trees close by. Uh, so the helicopter was down, but they were in the compound. Uh, the Blue Boy guys went in, to, uh, went in from door to door to the four houses, four compound houses there looking for the POWs. Now, Red Wine, the third helicopter, which was supposed to be the second helicopter in, they landed outside the compound where they were supposed to be, and they blew a hole in the south wall of the, of the fence, and they stuck up uh, their positions there as backup uh, for uh, the earlier helicopter. Now, Greenleaf's helicopter, who landed at the secondary school, suddenly appears and lands. The only trouble was it is now dark. One helicopter sees the other helicopter. Greenleaf landing late, the two helicopters don't know if it's good guys or bad guys. They're only about 60, 80 feet apart, so a firefight ensues between the two until somebody finally realizes that they're shooting at each other. Now, the uh, next slide. The Jolly Green Giant or Jolly Green Helicopter, this is what the Blue Boy helicopter looked like going in. It's a big helicopter uh, that crashed and uh, going in. But Blue Boy's team was the only team to actually go, I suppose, to go into the compound. They searched every room for looking for POWs and found nothing. Nobody told them that the POWs were not there. They just kind of uh, left that little part out. You know, they knew they weren't there, but nobody told these guys they weren't there. Uh, they got on the helicopters, uh, risking their lives, going into a place, uh, thinking they're doing a, a good thing, and nobody told them that uh, it was for naught uh, and so forth. But uh, they didn't know what ever told them, as I said. The whole raid lasted 27 minutes. That's the whole thing. That's going in, looking for the prisoners, not finding any prisoners, which means they went, probably went back through to look at it again. Uh, they ended up blowing the helicopter. It was in the uh, compound. They blew it up as they had planned on doing. Uh, and then they got back together. And I don't know whether Bull Simmons and, and them knew that uh, the uh, compound was supposed to be empty, uh, whether the intelligence people had bothered to tell the commanders that it was empty or not. I don't think they probably did. That's just my opinion, which is worth about nothing. Uh, so, but either way, they had to go in there fast to get things done and get out because of all the troops around. Now, during this raid coming in, there were two, two soldiers wounded. One of them was when the helicopter landed in the compound and the blades hit the, um, some trees and kind of crashed, uh, a um, fire extinguisher fell off the wall in the helicopter and broke a guy's ankle. That was wounded number one. Another guy accidentally got shot in the leg. Nothing bad, just shot in the leg. Other than that, there was no, uh, no, everything worked fine. Everything worked according to plan. The only problem was there was just no POWs there. But even though there was no POWs there, it was a blessing for the other POWs. And I'll get into that a little bit, uh, a little bit farther down. But uh, uh, according to the military, I'm going to read this to you because I don't want you to miss any part of it. Despite this intelligence failure, the raid was deemed a tactical success due to its near flawless execution. Let's see, we had to move the date. Helicopter crash. I already planned on a helicopter crash. Uh, one helicopter ran it in the wrong spot, and there were no POWs. But it was pretty much a tactical success, I guess. Um, even though there was no POWs there. The Sante Raiders, as they are now known, uh, for their action during the raid for the members of the task force were awarded six distinguished service crosses, five Air Force crosses, 83 silver stars. Now, why was the Sante raid a success? If you remember, it's about 30 miles from Hanoi to Sante. Hanoi was the capital of North Vietnam. Uh, Hanoi is where the uh, Hanoi Hilton and some of the other big uh, prisoner of war camps there 
I think there was about 12 or so prisoner of war camps scattered around in North Vietnam. But it showed them that the American POWs were not abandoned by the, the people of America. It showed the POWs they were not abandoned by the people of America. And the communists realized, could realize then that no matter where they were, American soldiers could land a force, a combat force, and assault anywhere they felt necessary, which means they could land at the uh, communist headquarters in Hanoi. None of them may have been com coming out, but they could have landed in there and, and, and done a lot of damage. So they realized that um, the, the ball, different, they were in a different ball game. As a result of the raid, where a lot of the POWs had been held all over, scattered all over, they, they uh, brought them back in Hanoi, where a lot of the prisoners, as we have talked with Bill Schutte and to Norman Gaddis, uh, who spent a great deal of time in um, solitary confinement, uh, all of a sudden now they were put into larger rooms with more, with, they were consolidated into Hanoi, but they were put in uh, bigger rooms or brought in with uh, other soldiers. So they were realized that there were other POWs besides themselves, which is where they came up with their um, uh, communication system they came up with on the TAP system and so forth. But they also realized that they were not there by themselves and they were able to talk with the other prisoners and go through and talk about what they had been through, what had happened and so forth. But uh, just seeing another American was also uh, very beneficial. You won't have happy they were captured, but it was good to see another American in the same situation you were, and they could talk to each other. Um, so that's, that was the one of the reasons that it was such a success. Going back again, this is the uh, Songte in town. You can see the river and the road going forth and so forth. Um, if you want more information about the Songte raid, <clears throat> I recommend that you uh, get th these two books, The Songte Raid, American POWs in Vietnam Were Not Forgotten, uh, The Raid, The Songte Prisoner Rescue Mission, uh, The Most uh, Daring Operation of the Vietnam War. That's some good reading and information. But let's talk a little bit about the Songte Raiders themselves. Uh, as I mentioned a while ago, a good part of them came out of uh, Fort Bragg, who was stationed Special Forces and, and so forth out of Fort Bragg. They were not all Special Forces. I think there was some... Uh, uh, SEALs and, and Marines involved in the group there, but uh, this is their, their patch. If you ever get a chance to go to uh, Fort Bragg and Federal, be sure to go to the Special Forces Museum there. You can see a lot of information about Songte Raiders and uh, some of the uh, people we've talked about on the show, such as Dan Pitzer and, and Nick Rowe uh, there at the uh, uh, camp and so forth. But the guy that was involved into uh, leading the group was uh, Colonel Simmons, Colonel uh, uh, Bull Simmons. As you can see, he kind of looks like a bull. Uh, he's not the kind of guy that you want to mess with, it looks like. But he was the ground commander of the, uh, Operation Ivory Coast, which was the group going in. He's the one that put together the team. Uh, when he came back, Richard Nixon presented uh, Simmons with the uh, Distinguished Service Cross for his outstanding leadership of this mission. Now, if you ever get a chance to come to one of our uh, Vietnam veterans' uh, uh, experience uh, functions, we do at the uh, museum, be sure to go over to Mike Cook's display. Mike Cook has some of the best uniforms and equipment displays you'll find anywhere in the country. But he happens to have the white dinner jacket, the white military dinner jacket on display that Bull Simmons uh, that owned before he, um, uh, I guess he got rid of it. I think actually Mike got it from uh, someplace uh, laundry. I think it was uh, he got stationed someplace else and left it at the laundry and never picked it up. But that's how that Mike got it. But it's a chance to see uh, a piece of history there with uh, Bull Simmons. But um, only three, only Simmons and three others knew that w what the mission was. As I mentioned before, they were all uh, told nothing. Five hours before takeoff. Simmons came in and told us 56 men. This is what this is a quote from him. We are going to rescue 70 American prisoners of war, maybe more from a camp called Songte. This is something American prisoners have a right to expect from their fellow soldiers. The target is 23 miles west of Hanoi. So even Bull Simmons thought there were 70 Americans there, even though the compound never held more than 55. 
a few men let out low whistles. I can imagine just uh, the shock and the excitement that went about. They spontaneously, they stood up and began applauding when they were told their mission. Simmons had one other thing to say. I want to read this to make sure I get it right. This is what Bud Bull Simmons is telling his troops. You are to let nothing interfere with the operation. Our mission is to rescue prisoners, not take prisoners. And if we walk into a trap, if it turns out that they know we're coming, don't dream about walking out of North Vietnam unless you've got it rings on your feet. We'll be 100 miles from Laos. It's in the wrong part of the world for a big retrograde movement. If there's been a leak, we'll know it as soon as the uh, second or third helicopter uh, sets down. That's when they're cream us. If it happens, I want to keep this force together. We back up to the Song Kong River and by Christ, let them come across the goddamn open ground. We'll make them pay for every foot across that son of a bitch. In other words, they knew that when they're going in, there was no rescue for them. Uh, there was much chance of uh, being uh, captured as POWs. Uh, they didn't know whether the uh, word had gotten out. All they knew that they were going in and uh, I guess that's what you would call a, um, uh, a suicide mission to a certain extent, but they were going in to find American POWs because we've always to been told we leave no man behind, which is another story we'll be talking about next show uh, with the young Marines. Now, some of you may have heard of uh, Colonel Bull Simmons besides the Song Hay Raid. He retired from the Army on July 31st, 1971, but H. Ross Perot, who on EDS, uh, which is a uh, software company, uh, who had uh, a large, his large contingent of uh, his company in Iran. And when his, his company was taken over and his guys were held hostage, he actually got uh, Bull Simmons to come in and put together a team, a team very similar to the Song Tay Raiders team. The only difference was the hostages were there. And he put together his team and he rescued the two men that were left. Uh, there, um, Ross Bro had actually gone into Iran himself and negotiated uh, release for uh, most of the people there. But the two leaders of his company, uh, they were held hostage. But uh, Bull Simmons went in to um, get them out. Now, I mentioned a while ago some of the awards. The Song Tay Awards are for valor recipients for the United States Army and Distinguished Service Cross, which is the medal right under the Medal of Honor. Uh, the people who got that, I'm not going to read all these, but uh, Colonel Arthur uh, Bull Simmons, Lieutenant Colonel Agent P. Sidnor, Captain Richard J. Meadows, Master Sergeant Thomas J. Kimmer, Sergeant First Class Tyrone J. Adderley, and Staff Sergeant Thomas E. Howe. Now, there's a list of civil stars. And then we're going to skip over for another list of civil star winners. And then we're going to talk about uh, Distinguished Flying Cross for the Air Force people. Uh, then the United States Air Force Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, Brigadier General Leroy J. Manor got that. And Air Force Cross and then more Civil Star winners. Uh, recipients, excuse me. That's right. Yeah, we don't win it. That's the bad way to win it. Now, I've got, uh, when I do this research for these uh, the shows like this, I put together, I go online, I read books, I uh, talk to people and so forth. Uh, I borrow people's information, uh, not using it for profit, so I go in and, and borrow some stuff. But if you want more information about the Song Tay Association and the Song Tay Raiders, uh, that would be some pretty interesting uh, stuff, these guys going in. Uh, it took a set of, uh, you know what, to, to go in and, oh. yeah, to go into that... Uh, situation not knowing whether they knew you were coming and if they didn't know you were coming you knew about the um uh troops around it and so forth but you're determined you're going to rescue the uh pow's because you want somebody to do the same thing for you but you can go into the song Tay association webpage and get some information uh some books out there about song Tay. and as i mentioned you can also go to uh, uh 
uh, Fort Bragg to the uh, Special Warfare, Special Forces School there and to uh, get information. But uh, I hope this show gave you a chance to uh, get some information or kind of whet your appetite to go in and do some further stuff. Uh, our next show uh, will be, as I mentioned before, uh, Carrie Turner, who was the cousin of uh, Joseph Har Hargrove, who was one of the uh, three Marines that were left on the island of Kotang. Uh, once the uh, uh, Gerald Ford sent the um, uh, Marines in to rescue the 31 sailors who uh, were, were captured on the ship by the communist uh, Cambodians. Uh, I think there was uh, 36 of the 40 people who were actually on the raid going in were killed in the process. But there were three young Marines left on the beach. There's been a lot of supposition about what happened to those young Marines. Uh, one time they said they were deserters because they didn't go where they were supposed to be. But they left with well, they left the three of them with machine guns. Said you hold them off and we'll come back and get you. And been a lot of different things. Uh, Water under the bridge that comes back now and says that shows that uh, uh, for one reason or another uh, they didn't come back. And we will tell you the next show uh, why they didn't go back. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to pick up the uh, this month's uh, Newsweek. Magazine. It's going to be uh, special in it about this, uh, this uh, uh, Marquez and the uh, three Mar three Marines were left on the island. Uh, get your background information, and we're going to have the man who spent the uh, last 10 years trying to get Joseph to come home. Uh, Joseph's brother was killed in Vietnam in 1968. When Joseph's mother, uh, before she died, Carrie, the cousin, uh, it was a close family. The cousin uh, told uh, Joseph's mother that he would do everything he could to bring Joseph home. Unfortunately, she passed away before uh, he was able to do this, but uh, he's out there uh, still working on it, trying to uh, straighten out history because these three young men were uh, spoken bad about for a while there on poli from political hacks and so forth. Now, let me give you an idea of some other things that are coming up so you can put this on your calendar. Uh, March 16th, we will be doing a symposium with the North Carolina Museum of History. And we'll eventually have that, that show, uh, that symposium on the, on the air here. But if you're anywhere around, we'd love for you to uh, come in and take part. It's the it's, uh, symposium. It will be on... Uh, that night from 7 to 9 o'clock at the museum. And the subject is going to be Vietnam, Gulf War I, Gulf War II, War in Afghanistan, similarities and differences. There's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences in the, in the, in the wars there. I have talked with uh, Gulf War veterans. I've talked with uh, Iraqi uh, Gulf War II, Afghanistan veterans. And there's so much difference between Vietnam and each one of those. The difference between Gulf War I and Gulf War II were unbelievably different, too. So we're going to be discussing that. And if you're out there and you're close by, I'd like to put out this invitation to you. I'd love to have you come join us on the panel. Uh, we're just going to, we're going to have a little bit of an agenda we're going to be talking about. It'll be out written out. We're going to ask some questions about uh, rules of engagement. How you got how you got into service, uh, how you were treated when you got out, and so forth. That's what we're going to be discussing. If you would like to be a panel member, please reach out to uh, NCBI. Excuse me, Lessons of Vietnam at NCBI.org. Can't get that right there. Uh, and reach out to me and tell me you'd like to be part. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, in fact, I'm going to give you my telephone number. It's 919-434-7345. I'd like to talk to you, get some ideas. If you don't want to be a panel member, give me some ideas of questions we can discuss and so forth. But I'd love to have uh, some of you uh, Gulf War veterans to come on and, and talk. Uh, it's time that the Gulf War veterans and the Vietnam veterans came together and, uh, and, got, and explained to the public what's going on. It's amazing how few people today realize there's a war going on. I've heard so many politicians lately uh, making uh, comments that they don't even realize there's a war going on. And 
you were over there, uh, put yourself on the line, you go over there and do what you can for your country and for your uh, fellow uh, soldiers. Uh, maybe we can reach out and get some of the um, uh, true information out there about what you're doing and what's going on and, and so forth. The rules of engagement are just unbelievable. Then on the 23rd of March, I'm sorry. Those are, the, those are just going to come in the tent. Uh, no ticket, no charge. Just show up at the Daniels Auditorium or the North Carolina History Museum downtown Raleigh. It's on Edenton Street, directly across from the uh, uh, state capitol. There's no charge. Uh, just come in and get your seat and uh, enjoy the uh, symposium. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period uh, at the end, so you can uh, get any questions that we don't answer during the symposium. So that's how you can get there. Uh, I'd love for you to take part, but that's what it is. That's the uh, 16th of March. Uh, it's from 7, uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, it may go over a couple minutes there with the question and answers, but that's how you can be part come and, and, and enjoy the show and so forth. Now, on the 23rd of March through the 27th, I believe it is, we'll be back uh, with, at the museum doing our third year of the Vietnam experience. We will have uh, some copy, some of this uh, this shows uh, going on uh, regular. Doing, we've got a big screen TV there. We'll have some of these shows showing on a rotation. We'll have the uh, much acclaimed uh, play Etchings in Stone uh, playing, uh, on, and then on Friday night and Saturday and I believe Sunday we're going to be showing special showings of the Etchings in Stone play about business uh, business to the wall in Vietnam. You've never seen it. Uh, it's been the years we have done it. It's been outstanding uh, as far as uh, uh, people coming back to see it over and over again. It's very moving, and you owe it to yourself to come and see it. We're going to have vehicles there. We're going to have uh, helicopters, weapons. As I mentioned a while ago, Mike Cook and his sort of stuff. We're going to have dioramas. We'll have a one eighth version of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. We'll have a computer there, which we'll be able to give you printouts of the people whose names you find on the wall. If you have someone whose name's on the wall, I'd be glad to help you find the name, uh, the panel, and also uh, do give you a printout and sometimes a digital rubbing of what's going on. So that's some of the big things that are coming up in March. Uh, of course, we got our show the 25th, and we have two shows in, in, Fed, in February. In, Fed, in February, uh, coming up, if you'd like to be part of one of these shows or have an idea of what uh, to be done, uh, let me know. The 4th of February, excuse me, next month of January, February. 4th of February, we'll be doing our normal uh, POWMI ceremony at the state capitol at 12 o'clock noon. And it just so happens that the uh, first Saturday of the month in March is also the 4th, which we'll be doing a special uh, service there. Uh, the February uh, POWMI ceremony will be done by the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Helicopter Pilots Association who, by the way, are going to be taking all their helicopters to Washington, D.C. They will be involved in the inaugural parade. Uh, they've been invited to go up there, so they're taking uh, a bunch of their helicopters up there to be in the parade. So if you're up there for the inauguration, you see uh, a bunch of crazy guys in helicopters on the back of trucks going by, uh, holler at them, tell them that uh, Bill Dixon said tell them hello. Uh, so they're going to be up there, but they'll be at the uh, symposium. Uh, M9 will probably have uh, one or two of his vehicles there at the, um, at the Vietnam Experience, as he normally does. Uh, Charles Bullock will have some there. So lots of different things going on, but we'd love to have you uh, join us for the show. Uh, thank you for tuning in. we also like to have you at some of our POW ceremonies. We'd love for you to come in and read the names. I know if you're way out of town someplace, there's not a whole lot you can do besides tune into the show. We appreciate you uh, tuning in each time. And I do need some ideas, though. I'd love to have some ideas and some comments and some uh, interaction between the shows. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And tonight we're going to finish up a little bit earlier than normal instead of going over a couple minutes. But again, remember the successful failure. Uh, even though it was a, fa a failure, uh, if you talk to anybody that was a POW, it was a success as far as they were concerned. Uh, even the ones who were moved at the last minute from uh, Song Tay to Dung Hoi. Uh, they felt it was a success because of the difference in the treatments they received uh, in the, uh, by the communists. So I guess it comes down to 
almost always, if you're American fighting man or woman, your country or your people in your country will never forget you and do whatever they can to bring you home, one way or the other. Thank you, and good evening. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.